Well, last night, I'm, I'm guessing like many of you, we enjoyed watching the Olympics, and there were some great stories, if you were rooting for the USA, um, with the USA winning both the men's and women's 4x400 four uh, relays on the track, Matt Centrowitz winning the 1,500-meter race, the first time an American has won that since 1908. Wow. Yeah, it's probably a good omen for the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> and Paul Chalimo, and we were kind of lamenting in our household, Paul Chalimo, who's a Kenyan, who's now an American citizen, and he's a part of what's called the U.S. Army's World Class Athlete Program. And, uh, which is a great program that we have. He won the silver medal in the 5,000 meters right behind Great Britain's Mo Farah. And each Olympian knows that she or he is competing, trying to win a medal in a specific field. For followers of Jesus, we're competing in the field of life. And the goal we are pursuing is godliness or Christ likeness. And once again from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and beginning at verse 24, we hear Paul say these words, do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. One of the things that's so inspiring to me about Olympians is the incredible passion drive, resilience, and determination they have to win. We've seen many races on the track this Olympics where people in straining for the tape, for the finish line, literally have just tumbled to the ground and even injured themselves. But when you watch these races, there's also been a lot of times, kind of like in Amazing Grace, where there's been dangers, toils, and snares, and people have been tripping and falling and getting knocked down during the races. But they don't take adversity lying down. They get back up and they get back in the race. We're going to show you a couple clips. First, from the movie Chariots of Fire, a clip about a quarter-mile race that Eric Little of Scotland was in as he trained for the 1924 Summer Olympics, and then one of Mo Farah of Great Britain from this last week. Let's take a look. Here's a description of Eric Little's race which took place in July of 1923, and in the movie they have him racing against France. In fact, uh, the actual race was a meet between Scotland and England. And this is what it said in the newspaper. In Stoke-on-Trent, in a race over a quarter of a mile, at the first bend, he tripped over the legs of the English runner J.J. Gillies, falling off the track. By the time he was back on his feet, the other runners were 30 yards away and moving fast, but Little attacked them with such pace that he finally overtook Gillies three yards from the line to win before collapsing spent to the ground. The circumstances in which Little won the event made it a performance bordering on the miraculous, wrote the Scotsman. Veterans whose memories take them back 35 years and in some cases even longer in the history of athletics were unanimous in the opinion that Little's win in the quarter mile was the greatest ever track performance they had ever seen. In the film Chariots of Fire, Little's father, who was a missionary, tells his son, you're the proud possessor of many gifts and it's your sacred duty to put them to good use. Run in God's name, and let the world stand back in wonder. And his point is that people of faith should sanctify the world around them, not reject it. 
And Little's explanation for why he runs is one of the most memorable quotes in the film. He says, I believe God made me for a purpose, for China, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. What do you do in your life that when you do it, you feel the pleasure and joy of God? Something to think about. I know it's hard to hear in that film clip, but when they show the scene in the stands and his trainer, who's his cousin Sandy, and his other relative says, do you think, he, the other guy says, do you think he can do it? And Sandy says, look, he doesn't have his head back yet. Because Little ran with that incredibly ugly, ungainly style when he really got going because his running was an act of worship. And he actually did put his head back like that when he ran. Well, he would go on to win the gold medal in the 400 at the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris following his usual tactic for, run, for running the race, which he described this way. I run the first 200 meters as hard as I can. Then for the second 200 meters, with God's help, I run harder. And indeed in that race, he ran the first 300 meters exactly 12 seconds, 12 seconds, 12 seconds, and ran the final 100 under 12 seconds. But rather than choosing a career in athletics, Little felt a higher call from God to become a missionary in China. And he served there until being interned in a prison camp in 1943 by the Japanese army during World War II. And even in the camp, his winning faith was an inspiration to others. Langdon Gilkey, who survived the camp and became a prominent theologian here in the United States, said the following about Little. Because they were in a camp where there were women, there were children, there were young people. He said, often in an evening I would see him bent over a chessboard or a model boat or directing some kind of square dance, absorbed, weary, and interested, pouring all of himself into this effort to capture the imaginations of these pent-up youths. He was overflowing with good humor and love for life with enthusiasm and charm. Think about that for a moment. How many people do you know in a prison camp would be described as overflowing with good humor, love for life, enthusiasm, and charm? That just staggers me. And Gilkey concluded, it is rare indeed that a person has the good fortune to meet a saint, but he came as close to it as anyone I have ever no. In 1 Corinthians 9, when Paul says athletes exercise self-control in all things, he was envisioning the kind of life led by Eric Little. And he's trying to use this as an illustration, but we all know that athletes do not exercise self-control in all things. Need I illustrate that this week? No, I don't. Too many, and I'm not going to embarrass anybody by naming names, are in the news every week because they are unable to practice self-control in all things and in many areas of their lives and in their relationships. And some athletes also will do anything to win, including cheating and doping. And I've never understood how people could feel good about winning when they know they've cheated. But obviously, lots of people care more about winning than they do about how they achieve it or how their cheating impacts other people and robs them of what should be rightfully theirs. And obviously, they don't care about their character as much as they do about winning. Paul's trying to make the point that athletes will sacrifice and discipline themselves through hard, punishing training in order to be able to win a, a laurel wreath or a medal or a trophy or a title or a championship and maybe some fame or fortune that might go with it. 
Paul is wanting us to think about the question, what are we prepared to do in the race of life and faith in terms of growing in godliness and becoming more like Jesus? Running to win requires purpose, and it requires passion. Purpose without passion lacks energy, and it lacks fire. It's just kind of there. Oh. Passion, on the other hand, without purpose, lacks focus and direction. Passion is the energy of our soul. It's intense emotion, compelling action. It's a strong devotion to some object, some activity or concept. And people can lack passion for a variety of reasons, such as familiarity. We allow something precious to become familiar, and we take it for granted. And that can be true of the people who are closest to us in our life. It can be true of things as simple as having a bed to sleep in, a roof over our head, clean running water, food in our refrigerator and pantry, even the freedom we enjoy each and every day. And our society is increasingly passive. And we live in many ways in a voyeuristic culture where many people live vicariously through other people's lives rather than pursuing their own with passion and purpose. People who live for themselves are in a small business. God desires passionate Christians who live for the Lord and for others. Titus 2.14 says, God who gave himself for us. Can there be any greater act of passion and purpose than that? God who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Not lukewarm about good deeds. Zealous for good deeds. Paul writes in Romans 12, 11, do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit and serve the Lord. You know, we tend to associate words like zealous and zeal. Well, those are for those like extremist people. Actually, no. <laughs> How zealous are you feeling this morning? How ardent is your spirit? Well, get with it, because I'm not sensing much <laughs> zeal or ardency out there. You know, you know what someone said about apathy, don't you? Apathy won't get you anywhere in life. But then again, who cares? <laughs> you know, at the end of Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem set his face like flint. He knew he was going to face the most difficult challenge of his life. And he keeps moving down that road, even knowing what he's going to face. And different people come to Jesus and say, hey, I'd like to follow you, but can I first go take care of this? Can I first go take care of that? And pretty legitimate things that they're asking to do. And Jesus just says, you know what? No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus had passion and purpose. And in our own lives, whether we're proud of our past, whether we're ashamed of some of what we've done, whether we're a mix of both, Jesus calls us from this day onward to make the most of our days, to make the most of the race of faith that we have to run for God's sake. In his book, A Dangerous Grace, which was written many years ago now, Chuck Colson, the late Chuck Colson, wrote a visiting Mississippi's Parchman Prison. And this is what he wrote. He said, most of the death row inmates were in their bunks, wrapped in blankets, staring blankly at little black and white TV screens, killing time. But in one cell, a man was sitting on his bunk, reading. 
As I approached, he looked up to show me his book, an instruction manual on Episcopal liturgy. Not exactly what you would expect on death row. John Irving, on death row for more than 15 years, was studying for the priesthood. John told me he was allowed out of his cell for one hour every day. The other 23 hours, he's in his cell, and he studies. Seeing that John had nothing in his cell but a few books, I thought, God's blessed me so much, the least I can do is provide something for my brother. Would you like a TV if I could arrange it, I asked. John smiled gratefully. Thanks, but no thanks. You can waste an awful lot of time with those things. For the 15 years since a judge placed a number on his days, John was determined not to waste, not to waste the one commodity he had that he could give to the Lord, his time. Those of us who are not in solitary confinement on death row have so much more that we can offer the Lord than just our time. But it takes self-control. It takes a determination to do our very best with what we have to win the race of faith in life. And you know, if we don't first offer the Lord our passion for God's purpose, most likely we won't offer our time. And while we don't like to think about it that way, there's a sense in which, you know what? We're all on death row. We just have much nicer surroundings and a lot more freedom. None of us knows the length of our days. None of us knows how many times around the track we have in the race of life. So what does true winning look like as a follower of Jesus? It's not about making money, although if you can make a lot and use it for God's purposes, great. It's not about material things. They're all going to end up at the recycling center or given to somebody else anyway. It's not about fame. You're better off with people not ripping you on social media anyway. No, winning the race of life includes being passionate about God and about eternal issues. It's being passionate about our family and our significant relationships, about the calling that God has given each and every one of us to fulfill in our life. It's about the next generation and the poor and the hurting and those who don't know God. Winning includes being passionate about what truly matters. And at the Olympics this week, we saw a great example of that that many of you have seen and heard about, but we're going to show it to you in case you missed it. As Shira Springer wrote in the Boston Globe after that race, she said, first there was the fall, then there was the reminder of all that makes the Olympics special and memorable. And that was during the semifinal heat of the women's 5,000 meters on Tuesday when D'Agostino accidentally clipped New Zealand's Nikki Hamblin. And dazed and disappointed as her medal chances appeared over, Hamblin, as you saw, stayed down on the track. And then D'Agostino placed a hand on her shoulder and said, Get up! Get up! We have to finish this! And according to Hamlin, she thought to herself, you know, you're right. This is the Olympic Games. We have to finish this. Still gets me. And so with 2,000 meters left, D'Agostino helped Hamlin get up, and the two continued on. D'Agostino said, at that moment, everything was happening so fast. Your actions are just instinctual. I just remember getting up and being like, you have to finish. That Nikki was able to respond was amazing. I, I really can't explain it. There wasn't a lot of rational thought there. It just happened. But the drama wasn't over. Because it turns out that D'Agostino, who is from Topsfield, Massachusetts, I'm proud to say, she suffered a serious knee injury during that fall. 
And the MRI after the race revealed she had completely torn her right ACL and her knee, her anterior cruciate ligament, also tore her meniscus and had a strained MCL. And she ran the final 2,000 meters on a torn ACL. <laughs> Grimacing in pain when they got up and started going, Hamblin was trying to encourage D'Agostino, and finally she had to leave her behind, and she figured the Dartmouth graduate wouldn't make it to the finish line. But little did the New Zealander know about New England grit. <laughs> and and D'Agostino finished the race, and she called it a miracle. And Hamblin, as you saw, waited for her, and they embraced at the finish line. They had never met before that race. And then D'Agostino was taken off in a wheelchair because she couldn't walk. And after the race, Hamblin called D'Agostino the Olympic spirit, right there. And since the race, that sentiment has echoed around the world. Hamblin said, regardless of the race and the result on the board, that's a moment you're never, ever going to forget. The rest of your life, it's going to be that girl shaking my shoulder like, come on, get up, and I really hope she's okay. And I know that she's young and she's going to have so many more opportunities and being such a good human being, she's going to get far. When you're at this level, you know how hard it is to get here. There's just a mutual understanding of how much everyone puts into it. I'm never going to forget that moment when someone asked me what happened in Rio in 20 years' time. That's my story. D'Agostino, who is a committed follower of Jesus, talked after the race about the lifetime bond she will share with Hamblin. And she reflected on the bigger message of their moment and said, there are so many young people watching this. They can see that a display of character has so much more weight than any accolades an Olympian might attain. Abby D'Agostino is running the race of faith with self-control, with passion, and with purpose. And I hope we can too. And if you came to worship today feeling like, you know what, I am down on the track. Life has tripped me up. I am down, I'm hurting, I feel like I can't get up. Remember that Jesus is standing right over you, that he has his hand on your shoulder saying, come on, get up, you have to finish this. So get back in the race of your life and run to win. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the inspiration that we can find in the lives of people of faith from as many years ago as Eric Little to this current week in Abbey D'Agostino. And God, I pray for all of us as we run our own race of faith. God, would you fire up our zeal. Give us greater ardency of spirit. And God, if we are discouraged, if we're down on the track, may we truly hear your word speaking to us. May we feel your nail-scarred hands telling us to get up. Come on, get up. You have to finish this, as I did, and I will help you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.